One of the things that I'm grateful for about Caleb and Karen is that, you know, a lot of people, and we're thankful for all of them, do student ministry and on university campuses, uh, but they have an intention to plug people who are interested in the gospel, and particularly those who respond to the gospel, into faithful gospel preaching churches where they see the community of God, they see the people of God loving God not only together but loving one another in Jesus' name. And so we're grateful for that. Obstacle courses were first used in Olympic events around 1900, but in 2010, some entrepreneurs decided it would be fun to create a race with, with an over-the-top obstacle course. They called it Tough Mudders. Perhaps some of you have, more aggressive people have participated in those, but these are now popular endurance competitions that require participants to complete a 10 to 12 mile course through some very rigorous obstacles, all of which are designed to play on human fears. I think some of them in, even involve electricity or something. But the Christian life, you know, if you've read your Bible, has often been compared to a race, even a marathon. But I wonder if it's not an even more apropos analogy to call the Christian life a tough mutter. Because throughout our pilgrimage, God superintends the hardships that his people face in this sin-cursed world in such a way so as to increase our dependence upon him. He increasingly trains us to trust in him instead of ourselves, instead of others, instead of any crutch that we prefer to lean on. And that means that as you seek to walk in the footsteps of your Savior, you are going to encounter difficulties. There will be times when you face the rejection of others. There will be hills of despair there will be even muddy pits of debauchery that you're exposed to as you seek to follow Jesus. All of these are superintended by our sovereign God to wean us off of self-trust and draw us more into trusting in him. Our faith in God, supplied by his ever-flowing stream of his grace, becomes our only dependable power supply. And so don't be surprised, and some of you older saints can attest to this even now, don't be surprised that the closer you get to the finish line of the Christian race, the more your only desire is to see your Savior's face and to dwell with him there forever in the paradise of God. That is the message that God had for Daniel as we conclude our study of this book in chapter 11 and 12 today, it's the vision that God gave him, and the title of the message is Persevere to the End. If you were here last week, we saw in the first part of this vision that runs from chapter 10 all the way through the first part of chapter 12, this wicked ruler who was the abomination of desolation. He was so intent on grabbing glory for himself, so envious that God was getting glory through the Jewish people as they worship him, that he slithered his way into Jerusalem on a Sabbath day, again intentionally, and he abominated the temple. He set up a statue of Zeus. He sacrificed a pig on God's altar. And so our interpretation was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes perfectly fulfilled this prophecy not long after Daniel's day. He was, in effect, what you might call the first of what the New Testament labels a man of lawlessness or what John calls anti-Christ. And so today, the vision recorded by Daniel, starting in verse 36, shifts to another, what we believe is a future king, well beyond Daniel's time, who would equally despise the God of Israel getting glory from his people. And Gabriel made it clear for Daniel that God's people would continue to be hated by all surrounding nations and that they, like us, need to prepare for the long haul. 
And so the first point of the message this morning is the first way to persevere to the end is be wary of Antichrist. Beware, Antichrist. Be wary of Antichrist. Each of you on your computer has antivirus software. Programmers have designed these programs, if you will, to not only identify, but to destroy malicious viruses that seek to harm your computer. And as the name implies, Antichrist are men throughout history who've been programmed by Satan to rise up against God and his lordship over his people. For example, I was surprised to learn this week, R.C. Sproul taught on this subject, that in Adolf Hitler's journals, it indicated that he actively worshipped Satan. And so you see the, the correlation between a, a, a devotion to Satan and his evil purposes and a destruction of God's people. All Antichrist in every age are programmed by the devil to attack God's people under the self dis Here's how they do it. This is important because you are not above this. I am not above this. The way that Satan programs people to serve him is by intoxicating people with the self-deception that they are, in fact, gods. They are, in fact, in control of their life. And so the apostle John teaches us in 1 John 2.18... He says, children, it is the last hour. This was written in the first century. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. There's been much disagreement among faithful interpreters, and I'm not here to disparage any of them. But in my opinion, the clearest example of an Antichrist, if not, some would say, the Antichrist uh, in the first century, was the unimaginably wicked emperor of ancient Rome named Nero. He and the Roman Empire subsequently under his sway, some would say that the Roman Empire of that day was the Antichrist, but he and the Roman Empire certainly fit the particulars of this vision. Follow with me as I read in verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. And so there's likely a twofold fulfillment to this prophecy, but at least in the first century, the short term fulfillment of this indignation is the judgment upon, of God upon the Jews for their apostasy. By apostasy, I mean that when they came back to the promised land and rebuilt the temple, that there was a half hearted devotion even among the priests. They were lethargic in their worship of God. They were hypocritical. But ultimately, this prophecy is ultimately pointing forward to their wholesale rejection of the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. Next week, we, be, we plan to begin a series throughout the summer on the parables of Jesus. And in them, Christ often speaks of his coming first to the Jews. That was his first priority. Get the gospel to God's chosen people. But they, Jesus says, like a fig tree without fruit, did not believe in him. That is the ultimate apostasy. And it will result for everyone who denies Jesus in final judicial action. So in the first century, then this wicked Nero and ultimately the empire of Rome, became God's agent of judgment upon the nation of Israel in the year 70 AD. Verse 37, he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all 
He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these. A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall, lou- he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. And so the key characteristic of all Antichrist of every age is they magnify, they worship themselves over and above every other deity. Even They even disregard parental instruction and God's innate design for human sexuality is totally disregarded. We see this to the nth degree. I don't want to go into the gross details of it. Nero was a sexual deviant to the maximum extent imaginable. And so the Roman Empire was then uh, under his sway, and they worshipped the god of bulwarks. In other words, they trusted in their own power, in their own militant power, in their own business dealings. They trusted in their own ability to protect themselves and to conquer others. Sinclair, Sinclair Ferguson helpfully teaches that lust for power, think about this in your own life, is simply the full-grown fruit of all sin. We start out just kind of wanting to control ourselves, but then that gradually begins to infect every sphere of our life to where we want to control everything. We want to be in power. Antichrist reward those who agree with their own inflated image because it affirms their own self-perceived deity. Again, every Antichrist during every period of time, both during this time and in ours, has a quest for autonomous glory. And these men were types of the final man of lawlessness that we believe is coming. This man will oppose the presence of Christ within his church through attacking her members. Listen to verse 40. And this is the timestamp of how we know this is talking about the last days. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries who shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. In other words, they were his allies. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. Again, that time stamp at the beginning of that little paragraph could simply mean the end of the indignation of the Jews, the finality of their judgment as the Roman Empire uh, attacked the glorious land in the first century. But in conjunction with the larger context, and especially what we're going to see in chapter 12, it's more likely that God is here prophesying attacks on his people in terms and nations, in other words, they're symbolic, for which the original hearers could understand and identify. For example, the ancient perennial enemies of Israel were uh, these countries that, that he said would would fall, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites, and yet he spared those who were his allies. And so if this is the case, this vision is portraying a final conflict between the kingdom of God manifest in the church and the domain of darkness led by an anti-Christ. And so, in other words, this battle and the takeaway that I would recommend to you in terms of application from this little paragraph is that there are only two teams on the playing field. 
that either you are in league with those who oppose the rule of God over his people, or you are, whether you realize it or not, on the side of the Antichrist. Verse 45 teaches us that right when the Antichrist figure is set up in the glorious land, at the end it says, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. Interestingly, that's precisely what happened to Nero in 68 AD. The uh, history records that he stabbed himself in the throat with a dagger and none could save him. That's likewise a picture of how suddenly the global progress of evil will end when the Lord Jesus appears to consume the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Suddenly, all evil will be eliminated. Until then, We must recognize that this is the spiritual battle going on right now in our lives. This is the timeless reality of spiritual warfare. The sway and influence of evil is so in tune, so coherent with the fallen nature of our flesh, that unless you are founded upon the rock, the solid rock of Christ's salvation, you will defect to the enemy's side in the face of persecution. When hardship comes, you will say, this is too hard, and turn away. Matthew 24, 9, Jesus himself predicts this. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. See how Israel was a type of that? Everybody, even today, still hates them. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so the reason that we covenant together here as members of the body of Christ, that we pledge ourselves to stand firm in the faith, not only as individuals, but as the people of God, to persevere to the end by the grace of God through faith in God's promises, is so that we can not only be on guard for ourselves, but we can watch over one another. We can care for one another. We can admonish one another. We can stand firm together against this spirit of antichrist that is already operating in full strength in the world. For if we wait until the full incarnation of Satan is reigning, we'll be liable to be swept away in his flood of deception and deny the one who loved us so much that he gave his own life to redeem us from what we deserve. And so the second means of persevering to the end is believing this promise. God will guard us through faith. God will guard us through faith. Throughout history, God has supernaturally protected his people, even in times of great hardship and persecution, by giving them faith in his word. He enables us to persevere through a spirit-empowered reliance upon the certainty of his promise. Listen to one of my favorite passages in 1 Peter 3, 5, 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so as we enter Daniel chapter 12, the last time is clearly in view. The first four verses are a continuation of the vision that started way back in chapter 10. And they talk about the, the, this turbulent tribulation, which scripture tells us will occur at the time of the end. These last days, Paul says, will be a period of, a period of rampant godlessness. And that will make it humanly challenging for you to maintain your faith. 2 Timothy 3.1, Paul said this, but understand this, 
church, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. But good news, God says through Gabriel, at the climax of what will seem to be a global reign of evil, I will send you my deliverer. Look at verse 1. At that time, time of the end, shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. And so Michael is portrayed particularly throughout the Old Testament as uh, an angel, a chief angel, designed or assigned to guard God's people, to protect God's people on earth, just as any earthly father worth his salt will protect his children from harm or at least assign someone that he trusts to carry that out, a caregiver. Your father in heaven has charged his angels to guard you against demonic forces during this age when evil seems to have the upper hand. Listen to Psalm 91. I hope this is familiar to you. <clears throat> Verse 11. For he will command his angels. Think of God as your father. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, even when we do stupid stuff. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So do not fear the future, children of God. No matter how wickedness seems to be prevailing, God has a purpose, even in tribulation, and he will see the church safely through it. Second part of verse 1 in Daniel 12. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. This is what our faith is in. This is where our trust is, that our deliverer is coming. And from God's omniscient perspective, he's already on his way. He's already sent his son Jesus to atone for our sins on the cross. And because that price for our sin was paid in full, God raised him from the dead on the third day. He ascended to the right hand of the father where he now reigns in glory. And he has promised to return in order to rescue us from this sin cursed world before her destruction comes. Listen to Paul spell out the logical order of our redemption. If you want a chronology of what God is up to, an overview of what God is up to in history, you won't find a better one than this. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Excuse me. <clears throat> but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Some of you may not agree with this, <clears throat> but the names written in God's book were not written there by us. Even though the whole human race sold under sin in Adam deserved nothing but to be damned forever in hell under God's wrath, happily headed headlong under Satan's leadership over a cliff of self-destruction. Just like you remember when Jesus delivered uh, the, that gathering demoniac in Gadara from all those demons and they went into the herd of pigs and what did the herd of pigs do? Immediately rush over the cliff and commit suicide. That is Satan's goal for humanity. And God reached down into this herd of humanity, headed headlong over a cliff and decides before the foundation of the world to ransom some, to create a remnant for himself, for his glory. This again is mystery. We as made in the image of God, ask the logical questions. Why not save all? Why save any? 
Why choose to save any? Why not just wipe the slate clean and start over with a new Adam? Well, that's in fact what God has done. Instead of wiping out every rebel on earth, God knew that it would bring him more glory to rescue a remnant of mankind, to graft them in by faith into a new Adam who is the Lord Jesus Christ, the man without sin, the eternal son of God who became the son of man in order to both live the perfect sinless life that you and I have failed to live and that God requires of every human being and to willingly become a sacrifice on the cross where God's death penalty, God's judgment of sin was poured out on his own beloved son until all the sins of all of his people whose names are written in the book were paid in full. That's our confidence. You want eternal security? There it is. God did it. God decided to save a worthless, helpless sinner like me. So he gets all the glory. After that act of justice was completely accomplished, after three days, God raised him from the dead. And I have to read from my old, beloved New American Standard, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, justice has been executed Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, remember, running under Satan's influence, under sin's influence over the cliff. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are guaranteed. Because God has written it in his book, and he promises, I will not blot your name out of my book. And so we long for the resurrection. That's the reality reality of what our faith needs to be in, Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Sleep is universally used throughout Scripture as a metaphor for people who have already died, and unlike beasts or animals who simply expire and are no more, all people made in the image of God have eternal souls. Because we're made in the image of God, we are the only creatures in creation that have eternal souls. And God's word here declares that on resurrection day, there will be a great resurrection of many who have died, bringing them back to life. Does does that sound impossible? I mean, flesh quickly rots, right? And even bones eventually all disintegrate. But nothing is impossible with the God who spoke all of creation out of nothing into existence. Nothing is impossible for him. And he prophesies through Ezekiel that by his omnipotent word, he will likewise bring about the miracle of the resurrection of the dead. Ezekiel 37, 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. It was a valley of dry bones. Behold, I... (laughs) will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews, in other words, muscles upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, his breath, and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. God has declared that even though we will all die physically because we're all born in sin, we're all sinners, he will raise many And I interpret that, what Revelation says, a multitude which no one can count on the last day, and there will be a great division at the judgment seat of God. By faith, the children of God are to live day by day in the light of this future hope. And so the final way that we persevere to the end is we long for our resurrection. Maybe you're already aware, but Northern Virginia is home to three of the top 10 
wealthiest counties in all of America. Loudoun is number one. And honestly, our part of Prince William County is almost identical uh, to Loudoun. There's more accumulated wealth here in our region than in some states. And yet, are Northern Virginians, by and large, happy? My answer is no, because a majority of the people's lives are still plagued with difficulty and despair. Multitudes, many of them, numb themselves daily with drugs and alcohol. Many more, I hope not some of you, live in a fantasy world of sexual addiction. Our best life now is, in reality, a nightmare. Human beings were not designed to exist for a mere 70 years or do strength 80. We were created to live forever in fellowship with our creator. People of the gospel who've been redeemed by Jesus realize it's futile to hope. And, and I challenge you. I've challenged myself this week. I challenge myself even now. And I challenge you. Be aware of when you're putting your hope and your trust in temporary fixes for your misery. False mirages on the horizon that you say, yeah, when that happens, it'll be okay. God wants you, he's redeemed you by the blood of his son to hope in the resurrection, to look forward to the final age when we will dwell with him forever and ever and ever he tells us about it in verse 3. And those who are wise, talking about in the resurrection, shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. What this means, church, believers, is that you will share in the glory of God himself. Just as a bride is wedded to her husband and they become one flesh, so are we who are members of the bride of Christ will be spiritually united to our bridegroom forever. We will reflect, we will enjoy, we will be permeated with the glory of God because we're under the blood of the lamb right now. He wants to ask each one of you the same question that Jesus asked Martha when she was mourning the death of her brother. Listen to John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you... Do you believe this? Do you trust in this redemption, in this resurrection? That's what God wants us to do. That we stop living for today or even for tomorrow and set all our dreams, all our hopes on the day of his return. And so God has recorded these words to fuel our faith, to enable us that Come what may, though all hell come against us in our family, in spiritual warfare, in our job, in our, in, our, in our country, in our nation, that we'll be able to stand firm, even in the midst of persecution. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Remember in Revelation, when they said, who is worthy to unseal the scroll? Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. One mark of the last days that I think is undoubtedly obvious right now is people searching the world over for meaning and truth. In my lifetime, man's intellectual knowledge has not just increased, it's exploded. I mean, there's double-digit exponents needed to describe it. But I pose a question. As a human race, and particularly in the Western world, has our endless quest to not only expand our comprehension of all topics, perhaps you're one of these or you know somebody that just searches the Internet, needs to know everything about every detail of everything, has that endless quest even our creation of artificial intelligence, 
Has that done anything to quell the anxious emptiness of our hearts? No. For as Blaise Pascal famously said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the human heart that can only be filled through faith in Jesus Christ. Daniel 12, 5. Then I, Daniel, so the vision is completed now. Daniel's telling what he sees. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, you remember him? We talked about him earlier, the pre-incarnate son of God clothed in white robe, his face shining like the sun, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. They asked him, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. Remember that angels are created beings. And like any other created being, including Satan, they're not omniscient. And so they're asking not only for the benefit of us, because these words would be recorded, but for their own curiosity, they ask the question on everyone's mind who hears this prophecy, when is this going to happen? And how long will the tribulation of God's people last? So they ask the man clothed in linen, the communication arm of the Trinity, if you will, And he answers in the most formal way possible because he not only raises one hand, he raises two hands to God in heaven in the form of a vow. And the holy name of God who holds all of time in his hands, he says this. He raised his right hand and his left hand, verse 7b, toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. Well, that, that's not helpful. Exactly. It's intentionally ambiguous. It refers to a sovereignly measured series of epics or ages, two and a half to be precise, a precise span which the Father has planned down to the very hour. That's where our trust is. God holds all of time in his hands. He lives forever and ever. And yeah, I won't go into that. We can trust him. And so he's communicated it here to his children in such a way that we trust in his unchanging control over all things. So that as children of God, sometimes in our highly educated, wealthy culture, we forget that we're just children day by day, eagerly longing for Christ to come. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. With all of our computerized technology, we can't calculate God's timetable. We yield up the timing of him unfolding his plans to him and then faithfully watch and wait for our Savior to split the sky. The Lord does tell Daniel what he plans to accomplish through all of this suffering, last part of verse 7, and that when the shattering of the people, uh, the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And so, There could be a a type there that when the indignation of God's judgment upon Israel is finished, that the tribulation will be over. That's one way to interpret it. But I believe that this is analogous to, you remember when Abraham is called the man of faith? I mean, certainly in the Old Testament, there's nobody greater than Abraham in terms of his faith. And the ultimate test of his faith, the ultimate elimination of any self-trust or self-will that he had is when he had to offer up his beloved son on the altar to slay him as a living sacrifice. God will likewise superintend the eradication of his church's self-reliance, and then the end shall come. Well, like you and I, this download was too large for Daniel's hard drive. He couldn't understand it. And if you think you understand it, you're better than Daniel. 
who heard it firsthand. And so that's a little humble advice to recognize that it's intentionally ambiguous. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, and this is his advice to us, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, and, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And so in Daniel's confusion, maybe like some of you, he was a real planner and just wanted to get some things on the calendar. God says in response, here's my overarching purpose, child, the sanctification of my people. I teach them, I train them to trust, and I purify them from all their sinful self-reliance, all of their sinful quest for their best life now, all of their sinful desire to have an earthly hope in a sin-cursed creation. I want to increasingly distinguish my church from the wicked through their unfailing hope in me. I want to clothe them in my son's righteousness and take them through a lifelong process of teaching them through suffering that their faith is enough, that their trust in an omnipotent God is enough, while the wicked continue to grope around the world in blind desperation. Again, while the timetable of this Fulfillment of this process is in the category. Some of you with security clearances will understand this. It's not necessary for you to know. That's what God says to you. This is not necessary for you to know exact times of this fulfillment. Your focus, child, day by day is to look forward to your reward. That's what he says to Daniel. Look forward to your reward. Believe that in Jesus you will have unending rest for your soul. Look at verses 11 through 13. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days, but go your way till the end and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end. Of the days. And so the immediate periods of suffering God has just described from for Daniel, measured from the time that Antiochus Epiphanes abominated the temple, was three and a half years. That's what the 1290 days is. This was a thumbnail sketch, a, a, a type, a thumbnail sketch, a, a, a living preview of a larger period of suffering and tribulation that will come upon God's people. But your job, Daniel, your job, church, is simply to keep walking in God's ways. Be a soldier in the army. You don't have a need to know all of the strategy. God says, I will take care of that, and I am with you to lead you in my ways. Keep believing that God will soon gather us to himself, where we will stand forever in the courts of his praise. May God give us grace to day by day persevere until that end. Let's pray together. Father, as your church that you chose to redeem with the blood of your dear son, to bring us into a new humanity, to bring us into eternal life in your presence, we we want to bring you glory on this earth. Lord, you are processing each and every one of us right now in various ways. We're going through suffering in various ways. And in the days to come, Lord, if we're correct in our understanding, the suffering is going to get worse. And so, God, thank you for your river of grace. Thank you for sustaining us with your presence. Continually fill your church, Lord, with your presence that we may have eyes for Jesus and long for your return. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing.